Good evening. I'm Dorothy Lazard, head librarian of the Oakland History Center of the Oakland Public Library. Tonight, we're sponsoring a book talk uh, on the new book by Robert Canigal, Hearing Homer's Song, The Brief Life and Big Idea of Millman Perry. It's an Oakland story. It's a history story. It's an academic story. And let me tell you about our speaker. Robert Canigal has explored the world through writing for over 50 years. After a brief stint as an engineer, he turned to writing, working first as a magazine journalist. His fascination with place and people has found a suitable home in the long form, which gives a writer time and space to really dig into his subjects. From Irish towns to male contraceptives to apprenticeships to fake leather, his career demonstrates a curious mind. He is the author of eight books, including High Season, How One French Riviera Town Has Seduced Travelers for 2,000 Years, Eyes on the Street, The Life of Jane Jacobs, and The Man Who Knew Infinity, The Life of Romano John. He's taught science writing for MIT for seven years, and his writing has appeared in scores of magazines, including Baltimore Magazine, the New York Times Book Review, Science Illustrated, Wilson Quarterly, LA Times Magazine, Psychology Today, and California Living. So it's my pleasure to welcome Robert Canigal. Take mm. it away, Robert. We go back, what would you figure, 20 years or so? Something uh, like that. A little over 20 years. Uh, yes. So thanks. I guess it was three and a half years ago when I came to Oakland to research uh, uh, with all your maps and directories and old books and people to help me. Uh, I was very dependent upon the resources of the library. And um, I thank you. I thank you as a representative of the library. Uh, the man I have been, was researching then and that I've spent the last three and a half years with uh, is probably the most important American classical scholar of the 20th century. He's the man who undercut much of what we thought we knew, the Odyssey and the Iliad. The name Milman Parry is right there in the subtitle of the book. It's his bio. He grew up not really very many blocks from the Central Library. Mine is a book about his brief life, his peculiar, absolutely driven personality, his travels and adventures in faraway places, his troubled marriage, and above all, his big idea. And that idea is about Homer and the making of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Homer's why the world cares about Milman Parry. Homer was the center of his life. So let's hold off for the time being on our friend Milman, who is the center of my life for the last few years, and turn to Homer. Homer is the veritable first cause of the Western literary tradition, author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the two great epic poems of gods and goddesses, heroes in war. Epic because they were long, 25,000 lines of ancient Greek verse making up the two of them because they told of honor, high ambition, bravery, of the yearning for home, all on really huge poetic canvases. The Iliad is centered on Achilles, who angered by what he perceives as an injustice, refuses to go to war, he refuses to lend his matchless warrior skills to the um, uh, battle with the Trojans. The Odyssey is about Odysseus and his, his during a 10 year journey back from the Trojan War to Ithaca and his wife, Penelope. Both poems have large tests of characters, long speeches, lots of blood, lots of gore, nobly expressed feeling, memorable scenes of Odysseus 
tied to the mast of his ship so he can has a better chance of resisting the sirens, the call of the sirens, of Achilles dragging the dead body of um, Hector around the walls of Troy. These are scenes that whether we've read the Odyssey of the Iliad ourselves, some of us know about anyhow, because they're just part of, a, part of uh, the Western tradition. Once, once upon a time, the Homeric epics were the one sure element of a reputable university education. But even those with really thin memories of Homer might dimly recall the, the visions of Greek ships hauled up on the, on the beach opposite Troy, uh, or Odysseus slaughtering the suitors Penelope suited these slack, selfish men who defiled his palace in Ithaca. There's so much in the Homeric epics. Now, let me say this, that there's no law that says you have to like Homer. That's the great thing about libraries and about books. There's something for everybody. And nobody can tell you what's, what great is supposed to be and what's not. It's waiting for you to explore. You can develop your own tastes. Homer is supposed to be great. I, as I came into him late in life, I found it a wonderful experience to expose myself to these stories. But you don't have to like them. Not every ear over the great of the past three millenniums has been receptive to Homer, whether in Greek or in translation. Even with a devoted teacher, many a high school student has had his fill of Homer with, you know, one more brain getting splatted by a bronzer in Troy and has no wish for more. Homer doesn't take with everyone. But one day in the summer of 1923, Homer did take with Milman Parry. Now we're back to Parry. He's not known to most of us. I hope that with my book, he'll be better known to many of you. Uh, but I think just to bring us up to square zero, three, five minute uh, digression into Parry's life. Uh, he was born in 1902, five, at the age of 33. He grew up in Oakland the son of a not entirely successful druggist. He, his father's name was Isaac Parry, and uh, he had five children. His mother died at the very height of the uh, Spanish flu influenza, Spanish flu epidemic. So exactly at the height, if you look at the, the graphs of deaths versus time, it almost seems that it's guaranteed that that's what she died of, but apparently she didn't. She died of, of cancer. Um, <clears throat> we can't point to a particular house in Oakland that he lived in because he lived in so many of them. Uh, the directories from the Oakland Public Library show that he moved around a lot, often every, every year or two. The whole family moved in quest of something a little bit better, didn't always find it. And like I said, his father wasn't super ambitious and didn't have, um, uh, wasn't the kind of a person who pushed himself. Um, but mostly they never got too far from the area around 24th Street and Telegraph Avenue, which was where Isaac Parry, for much of this time, worked as a druggist. Sometimes during some of this period, he seems to have owned the store. And then at other times, he was an employee of it. Once Millman's father stopped a robbery at the drugstore, the, the guy actually shot at him. And his name was all over the newspapers. The holdup man wound up back in back in prison. So not too many classical scholars at Princeton and Yale and Harvard had fathers who were held up in, in robberies. Millman went to the local high school, Oakland Tech, just a year or two after they put up the new building, where he did well. He studied Latin, a fair bit of mathematics. He was a Boy Scout, a chess player, a tennis player, a basketball player. <clears throat> 
He was an active and intelligent person with an active and intelligent mind. He won school prizes. In 1919, he started at the university that we all invariably call Berkeley. Uh, but it took me a while to get it that nobody called it Berkeley back then because Berkeley was the only campus of the University of California. I think Los Angeles, UCLA came a couple of years later. So I gradually absorbed the little Berkeley, it was Cal. Everybody talked about Cal. At Cal, he enrolled as a pre-law major, but after his first Greek course, he kept on coming back for more and more Greek. His sister, Addison, wrote later, Greek became his deep and abiding love. I think it was the sheer beauty and grandeur of spoken Greek and the great delight the Greeks found in simply being alive that attracted him in the first place. In the spring of 1922, Perry, still a student, student Marion, they became lovers. She got pregnant. In May of the following year, they married. Their child named Marion was born in January, 1924. By the way, she became a rather accomplished uh, artist and illustrator. Uh, she died a few weeks ago at the age of 97. Parry graduated from Cal in 1923. The following year, he earned his master's degree at Cal based on a short thesis devoted to the work of Homer. We'll get to that later. For now, let me just remark the fact of it. He earned his master's then. A little bit later, Parry and his wife and his uh, daughter got in a ship. Well, first they got to New York and they got in a ship and they headed over to Paris uh, where they inhabited one of the suburbs of Paris. Later they moved from there. Basically, they had a deal. He had failed to get funding for a PhD and his wife, who came from a well-off family in Milwaukee, basically they made a deal. And the deal was, I'll put you through your education. You get, you get your doctorate, well-paying position at a great university, and then you'll support me while I go back to school. That was the deal. Sorbonne, worked with a succession of French um, scholars for a doctoral thesis that represented not a departure from what he had done at his, in his master's thesis, but a, a deep and ex a development of it that was really, exhaustive is the only word that you can use. He, he took all the basic ideas that brought up tentatively in the master's thesis and developed them and developed them and developed them. In 1928, he defended his thesis. He got his doctorate around the same time. His wife gave birth to a second child. Uh, back in America, he taught for a while at a small Midwestern college, Drake. Um, briefly in 1933, he went to Yugoslavia. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then for a second trip to Yugoslavia, field research. So he came back to America and four months later he was dead of a gunshot wound suffered in a Los Angeles hotel room. As I said, just the facts, I hope I kept that to about five minutes. What seems to be the really transformative moments of young Parry's life came in the spring summer and fall of 1923. It seems that in the spring of 1923, he had decided to become a writer. He was on the uh, staff of Occident, which is a literary magazine at Cal. He had written a few essays, one of them rather strange. I never quite figured out what he was saying. Um, he had become rather taken with an Irish essayist whose name does not come down to us. I'd give anything to find out who it was who had so, um, who Parry had become so enthralled by. So he was all set. He knew what he was doing. Right. You knew what you were doing when you were 21? 
That's how Milman Parry knew what he was doing. Turns out um, he, he approached one of his Greek professors, Ivan Linforth, and declared he was finished with classical studies. Spending time with Aeschylus and Homer was, he, this is what he told Professor Linforth, um, would corrupt his natural talent as a writer, his natural talent and style. Now to Linforth, all this sounded like a fait accompli. This was what the boy had decided. And from what he'd seen of him in, in class, Parry was a pretty sharp student, but he was no genius. He didn't stand out that greatly. So he didn't try to argue with him and he wouldn't try and he didn't try. Pause. The next time the two of them met was in the fall of 1923. But now the way Linforth told the story later, Milman no longer talked of a writer's life. He seemed to have forgotten the whole idea completely. Now all he could talk about was Homer. I'm not at the point where I, all I can talk about is Homer, but it is true that over the past dozen or so years, I've gotten caught up with Homer myself. I'm not a classical scholar. I write for ordinary educated people. I try to tell human stories with a little call it intellectual meat on them, but the stories being as important as the subject. So I can't read Greek any better than you can. One of my books, The Man Who Knew, but I can't read it. For hearing Homer's song, song I took a few lessons in ancient Greek from a, um, a classical um, a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, who's in a PhD program, just really to get a little flavor for the language, to get a sense of how it worked, what was characteristic of it. As for Milan Perry himself, I came to him through a kind of back door. A lot of people have said after they hear about, I've written a, a biography of this guy, Milman Perry, how did you come Perry? I tell, I'll tell you. I've always been a servant or maybe a slave to my enthusiasms. 2007, one of my enthusiasms was a little island off the west coast of Ireland called the Great Blasket, inhabited by a few fishermen who all spoke Irish, Irish Gaelic. All through the first half of the 20th century, this island had attracted scholars and linguists and writers from all over Europe who were interested in the people, how they lived, and how this little island had resisted, had held out against English. Because they all spoke Irish and only Irish. One of these visitors was an Englishman named George Thompson, who first arrived in the Blasket in 1923 and took a lively interest in it and the people there. But the thing is, this Thompson fellow was not a scholar of things Irish. He was actually a classicist. For most of his, he was professor of Greek at the University of Birmingham, a student of Greek lyric poetry, Aeschylus and Homer. Now for reasons that I had plumbed my inner psyche enough to figure it out. But for one reason or another, I found Thompson a really warming and inspiring figure to the extent that I found myself intrigued by whatever intrigued him. And it was Thompson who really dragged me into the classics. Soon I was launched on the, on the Odyssey and the Iliad in the great Robert, Robert Fagel's translations, which I would recommend to anyone. These were my first forays into Homer since junior high school. I'd like to take, while we're still talking about Homer and purely Homer, I'd like to take a short digression. Um, I'm a latecomer to Homer, and I suppose I could be enlisted as a spokesman for the idea that there's no one best time to learn about any subject in the sciences or of the humanities, and I do think that's true. But still, college counts, universities count, count, 
And it was in college in a university with a very strong classics department that Milman Parry was seduced by Greek, by ancient Greek. And now we learn, we hear this grim talk that from Howard University, that this fine historically black university plans to close its classics department. You hear all the usual arguments, the enrollments are down, cost benefit analysis, and besides the, they'll be able to take individual courses in the classics, but they won't be able to, it won't be a, a unifying department that can shepherd people through the field. I think there's a real loss represented in this uh, for Howard University and its students and for our appreciation of the, the past, or at least this one corner of the past. It's not the whole past, but it's one important corner of uh, how our world became what it was. So I think that's a loss. Anyhow, that's, that is a digression. And, but it's something I wanted to say. In the end, I was caught up in, in George Thompson's idea about, ideas about the Homeric question. That's what scholars have called it for 200 years. Well, endlessly fascinating debate about who Homer was, when and where he'd lived, and just what he'd actually done. It's the Homeric question that led me to Milman Parry. Who was Homer? That was for sure. One scholar um, sort of calculated it that seven towns or cities in had claimed Homer as their as their son. Uh, none of them with particularly convincing proof. The fact is nobody knows. Aristotle in the fourth century BCE talked about Homer. So did the Jewish historian Josephus in the first century CE. It's been around for a while. Some have wondered whether the Homeric epics were actually composed by different people. Others noting all sorts of sort of weird aberrations and linguistic infelicities in them. Imagine the epics as cobbled together and not always artfully from numerous original sources. This little book, little bit that follows comes straight from the book. And I'll read it. The identity of Homer, who or what he was, whether one person, two or more, when he lived, how he or others composed the Iliad and the Odyssey, and even what it means to have composed them have for millennia been raised as questions. These questions answered, muted, new challenges thrown down, new evidence gathered in rebuttal. Indeed, for literary work so ancient, so cherished, it's remarkable that such scholarly conundrums, collectively referred to as the Homeric question, were still, by 1923, big. Even with the coming of Milne and Parry, they have not been, and may never be, entirely resolved. Uh, accorded his name, helps establish Homer as real, as kind of the epitome of genius, almost as if he were a god. He did poet, wrote two great epic poems, was for centuries taken for granted by most classical scholars. Stanford University's Richard Martin has written, not even the most hardened cynic doubted that Homer, the master poet, once existed. And the same goes for the ordinary reader. The ordinary reader of the epics wouldn't really give these questions much thought. You'd be thinking of Odysseus' escape, escape from the Cyclops or the making of Achilles' shield in the Iliad. These are vivid scenes. They come to life. This is what you think about. You don't think about questions like this. In Parry's time, too, most readers would have assumed that whatever the implements of writing available to him, Homer, whoever he was, and whenever he lived, at some point sat down to write the two poems attributed to him. After all, he was the author. If you get the book, the dust jacket says Homer on the front. So Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, and Shakespeare wrote Macbeth, Plato wrote the Republic, 
and Homer wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad. Simple, said Milman Parry. It wasn't so simple. Things weren't as they might seem. The idea apparently came to him in, relatively speaking, a flash. During the period between those two meetings with Ivan Linforth that I mentioned before, Parry tried out an earlier fragmentary idea on Linforth and wondered out loud whether he might write a master's thesis about it. And Linforth said, OK, go ahead. And so beginning with his master's thesis in Cal and then later developing what he had originally conceived in great length and detail, uh, then at the Sorbonne and then later at Harvard, Milman Parry showed that he, Homer, couldn't have written the Homeric Epic because in their earliest form, they weren't written at all. Some other quite different creative process was at work. They had become what they, what they became through some shadowy, traditional, apparently collective process, not by individual talent and artistry alone. They were the work of generations of illiterate oral poets who, can, who composed in real time, like on the fly. As they composed, as they sang, they couldn't just stop in the middle of, they couldn't erase, they couldn't cross out lines the way we do. They couldn't start all over again. They were doing something entirely different from what writers in any age did. They weren't writers, they were singers. And whatever they did there in front of their listeners, their audiences, they just had to keep going. Now, do you be silenced just now as uncomfortable as I did? I suspect probably yes. As I speak to you, I'm working to ward off the stark terror of not having notes. The ancient oral poets had no notes. They were illiterate. They very likely lived before the appearance of an alphabet in Greece. As they spoke or sang their songs, they couldn't pause. They had to keep going. They had to keep the story moving. And it's from these unknown people, perhaps hundreds, perhaps thousands of them, we don't know, that our Iliad and our Odyssey came from. This was Parry's big idea. Now, the clue that led Parry to his new idea were the repetitions that marked the text as they come down to us. In both of the epics, everything repeats. If you're, if you're a writer, you learn that the one thing you don't want to do is to repeat. And to the extent that you do repeat, you want to catch it in editing, cross it out, find another way of saying it, not say it at all. That's what writers do. But in an oral tradition, that's not what people do. They do repeat. And in the epics, they repeated themes, they repeated whole speeches sometimes. And one of the things most repeated were the so-called epithets, like swift-footed Ach Achilles, or wily Odysseus, or wine dark sea, or cunning goddess Calypso, or earth shaker Poseidon, dozens of others. I should add now that the word epithet has in recent years been kind of sullied by the opprobrium of the phrase racial epithet. But here the word carries none of that recent taint. Uh, you might think of um, Richard the Lionhearted. That's uh, the kind of epithet we're talking about. Or uh, to the baseball lovers in the crowd, Babe Ruth, Sultan of Swat. I grew up hearing about that. Now, to a receptive ear, these epithets made for a kind of and contributed to their to the sometimes mesmerizing impact of the whole. But Parry saw more deeply into them. He discovered distinct patterns in how and when they were used. They would appear in this line or in that in a particular position in the line. They helped fill out 
out the poetic line. They made it sound right. The Homeric epics, we sometimes forget because they've been translated into prose and they've been translated into poetry, but originally they were poetry, pure and simple. Dum diddy, dum diddy. So, something like it is the normal rhythm of the Iliad and the Odyssey as they clip along the epic line on the epic page. This metrical scheme known as dactylic hexameter is the mainstay of Greek epic poetry and defines it. It's a rhythm that by now is sort of closely associated with gods and goddesses and heroic actors in heroic times. Like, you know, in English, we rely a lot on iambic pentameter and dactylic hexameter doesn't work too well in English. Anyhow, the epi these epithets that Harry was so preoccupied with, satisfy the poem's rhythmic demands. That's why they're there in the first place. Yes, be heard as lovely or beautiful or charming or hypnotic, hypnotic, but for the oral poet in the throes of poetic creation, telling his largest story, composing on the fly, these epithets help make it all possible. They appeared not when the story decreed but when they were needed to make the poetic line sound like poetry and not an, an unmelodic heap of words. They were used as needed to move the great story along in the act of composition itself. Well, of course, there's much more to it than that. Maybe I've gone on too long as it is, but I wanted to give you at least a little glimmering of what he had done. But he spent the next mm, 10 or 12 years, most of the rest of his life, working and developing this, these, these in relation. He did up to Paris, which was 1928, was the work to his famous. And then he went off in other directions. No, he devoted his entire working life to these ideas, to this one idea, really. The only trouble is that after a while, he realized that something was missing. He had been doing all this work only through the ancient texts themselves. <clears throat> he was talking about oral poets, but he'd never met an oral poet. If he had run into an oral poet on the street, he wouldn't have recognized him. And I think he was a list by that. Bit of chronology, he got this Sorbonne doctorate in 1928. Now let's flash forward to 1931, getting his sister Addison uh, a letter. <clears throat> He's at Harvard at the time, pretty much comfortably ensconced. He writes Addison of uh, the children that he'd just seen, one of the early talkies, Marlena Dietrich, as a matter of fact, of how he had a tooth pulled, uh, that he was going to spare his poor sister, the gruesome tale of what that was like. Actually, it was really kind of unrevealing. As usual, Milman Parry did not reveal much of himself. He kept, he kept things in a light key when he was writing to his sisters. But he did have one hard kernel of real news. I am just now studying Serbian so that I can read Serbian epic poetry. Then in two years or so, he'd apply for a fellowship and spend a year in Yugoslavia to find the explanation of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Well, sure enough, by 1933, Parry was in the former Yugoslavia with his family briefly the first year, then they there for a year and a half. Parry went from town to town, village to village, finding oral poets, most of them illiterate, who embodied Serbian and Bosnian and Montenegrin and Croatian traditions of epic poetry. He had done some research and found that in Yugoslavia, there were people who seemed to be the equivalent in modern times of the kind of epic poets who had originated in the Iliad. These people were known as Guslars for the one that they, they 
sang with a one stringed instrument called the goosler, an awful sounding thing, if you ask me, uh, or put more generously, it takes some time to develop a taste for it maybe. So they played this instrument as they sang. Parry tracked them down across Yugoslavia and recorded them in the sound recording, pretty early sound recording equipment that he had taken to Yugoslavia. Parry's daughter, Marion, who is, ten, remember both his wife and his daughter were named Marion, who was 10 years old at the time of the second trip, would later offer a kind of child's eye view of her father's trips from Dubrovnik, where they were living, where the family stayed when uh, Milman went into the Yugoslavian backcountry. Now remember, this is Parry's daughter, as an adult, remembering how she heard it as a child from her dad. She wrote this. My father explained that Yugoslavia was an uncivilized country at the edge of the world on the border of the Slavic wilderness, which stretched from the Adriatic to Alaska. Since hardly anyone could read or write, Yugos since hardly anyone could read or write, Yugoslavians still had retained their oral poetry and their ancient native national civilization. They were still heroes and heroic acts, and the ancient heroes were celebrated in ballads by gooselars or bards who knew by heart so much poetry that if it were written down, it would fill libraries. But the whole thing depended, my father explained, on the fact that they couldn't write it down. As soon as literacy becomes common in a country, everyone gets lazy. They don't bother to learn things by heart anymore, and poetry is no longer a part of so that's how Marion learned it when she was 10. Parry returned to the States in the fall of 1935, excuse me, with half a ton of recordings on aluminum discs, but he had a chance to study them very little. After his death, they were the work of his young assistant, Albert Lord, the student who'd accompanied him on that second trip to Yugoslavia. <clears throat> these hundreds of songs, along with the interviews that they had also done of the Gooselars, showed just the kind of creative process that Parry had envisioned based on the texts alone. The texts of the Odyssey and the Iliad. Their, their triumph was one particular singer named Avdo Medetovic. His long, his long songs of Balkan law, some almost as long as the Odyssey and the Iliad, rich in story and flavor and detail, seem to provide the final proof of Parry's explanation <clears throat> for the roots of the Homeric epics. So what have we got here? A happy ending? Well, it might have been, and it could have been, but a few months later, as I've said, after Parry's return to the States, in late summer of 1935, he was dead, in shot wound in a Los Angeles hotel room with his wife. They were going down to San Diego to see his sister and their family. They just come from the San Francisco Bay Area in what sounds like sort of a victory lap after the success of the Yugoslav. But there in that hotel room, a revolver went off, the bullet grazed Parry's heart. <clears throat> Hotel staff first surmised that Mrs. Parry had killed her husband. Police were called. Two veteran LAPD police officers arrived on the scene. They interviewed Mrs. Parry. No charges were filed. The official ruling, an accident, caused, according to Marion, by a revolver wrapped in her husband's suitcase, somehow going off maybe dropped, you know, wrapped some pajamas or something was wrapped around them and they fell and it went off and it just happened to hit his heart. <clears throat> Over the coming years, rumors would abound and linger that Parry had committed suicide. I'm sorry, I don't see any evidence for this at all. There's just virtually nothing to suggest suicide. On balance, uh, the judgment of the police has something going for it, that it was an accident. It's a little hard to imagine 
his wife killing him. Um, and the police came to the conclusion after talking to Marion, although not for that long, that it was an accident. However, there is a less, there is another alternative, and that that Mrs. Parry killed her husband. And this is this this is what uh, their granddaughter Marion, the other Marion, the one who I quoted to you before when she was ten years old. This is what she has grown up, she has uh, lived with all her life, the conclusion that her mother killed her father. What possible motivation? Well, look, for a lot of us, um, I mean, there's a whole other side to Milman Parry. There's a whole lot, another side to everybody. A personal life and a married life with Marion. Men and women do great things in the world. They become ballerinas or test pilots or entrepreneurs, maybe they achieve fame, but they have a personal life too and a private life. And that's not always as exposed to view. And they, people are not always happy. And uh, um, these exposed to view. So again, what is the possible motivation? Maybe it was much more cool-headed, a revenge for imagined infidelities, being ignored by him a little too much, and other hurts he'd inflicted on her over the years. Mrs. Parry and her daughter, twisted by a lifetime's mutual antagonism, were both named Marion, and Marion the younger was all but certain her mother had killed him. In 1931, a woman named Pamela Newhouse, a young graduate student in class, decided she wanted to write a biography of Milman Parry. She didn't go ahead and do it, but she did some of the preliminary steps. And one step, <clears throat> which she did in preparation for embarking on this project, was to interview Marion Parry. For three days in early December of that year, she sat down with Mrs. Parry and talked with her about her life, about her husband, about their travels, about their disappointments and frustrations, and no little resentment, no little anger billowed forth. Again and again across these three days, Millman emerges as coldly single-minded, distant and unmoved, heedless of her needs, not really interested in her. Whether in Paris, Cambridge, or Dubrovnik, she was left to feel lonely and ignored. In her conversation with Newhouse, Marion periodically, as she's talking, and she sometimes goes off on these, these reveries, but she would periodize what she was saying she realized how it must sound to somebody else. She drift into reverie and hear an insistent criticism as they surface, catch herself, vow that she is going to rebalance her account, her portrait of her husband, but she never really manages to do that. On page 32 of the transcript, remembering where the interview had broken off the day before, she says, I wanted to tell you some nice things about our marriage, but it's really terrible the way I made it sound. So awful. And that recurred again and again. As I tried to work out just what happened in that hotel room in uh, Los Angeles, 90 years, like a lot of writers, a little bit obsessed. I went through all the old news reports. I found documents at I traced the history of the hotel. I went to the hotel, which has since been redone into a, a home for downtown indigents in Los Angeles for local street people. I walked through its halls, tried to imagine a little bit of what that hotel might have been like in 1935. I became a little bit obsessed. It happens if you're writing a biography. <clears throat> At one point, I told my friend Joel, this, this little adventure of exploring the hotel and so on. What he said was this, why should any of that matter? 
Who cares how your friend, how your Mr. Parry died? Who cares if his wife killed him? Isn't the important thing what he did in his life? Well, I guess I don't hold to quite so lofty a view. I'm interested in death as well as in life and the frankly of human nature, as well as the sunny and the noble and the good of how people are sometimes led by the nose of their own anger. I suppose I wouldn't be a writer if I didn't sometimes feel that way. So I concluded that maybe it was okay if I was a little pre- was. But my friend Joel was right too, that the important thing was what Parry did and what he as I ended the book. Parry created a new idea of poetic artistry. This is his memorial. He imagined a new way of looking at old words and how they'd come into the world that profoundly influenced all of classical studies and in time, the humanities generally. Turning to the same facts and the same ancient texts, he saw in new ways what they implied, asked new questions, and fashion new tools with which to study this variant species of poetic expression, one formed on the breath of word and song long before anyone was there to take it down. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Thank you so much, Robert. That was fascinating. Um, before we begin, I just want to reiterate for people who um, came later before after we started. My name is Dorothy Lazard. I'm the head librarian at the Oakland History Center of the main library. Um, thank you for coming uh, to hear Robert Canigal talk about his new book, uh, Hearing Homer's Song, The Brief Life and Big Idea of Millman Perry about a, a Oakland boy. Uh, it's fascinating for me, Robert, to hear uh, how he did so much in such a short time. And I want to open up our uh, q and I, I'd like to invite people to either write your questions in the chat or, or uh, raise your hand with the little hand symbol so I can uh, call on you in some kind of orderly fashion. But I want to start with... Um, just some questions of my own. Uh, for one, I'm curious to know how soon after Perry's uh, discovery and Lord's promotion of his mentor's work, did academia recognize how revolutionary an idea uh, or how evolutionary an idea uh, Perry's work was or Perry's theory was? A few people, um did right from the beginning, from 1928, 1929, 1930, uh, when they got hold, but the Sorbonne thesis, of course, was written in French, <clears throat> and it was very intricate, very technical, not beautifully written, uh, mount detail, so it didn't have an instant hold on people, um, but it was received with enough respect that it landed Parry at Harvard a few years later. So, uh, and a few early scholars, early classicists saw from the beginning that there was really something there. But I think for 25 years or so, let's say from 1935 to 60, it was part of the academic discussion, but it really blossomed with the writing of Albert Lord's book a singer of tales. <clears throat> Albert Lord was the young assistant of Parry, 10 years younger than he, who um, finished his PhD at Harvard and very slowly and very gradually, and a lot of scholars complain, when are we gonna see the Parry's work published? And it was, it was very slow in coming, but then the singer of tales, his masterwork, was basically all rooted in the work that Parry 25 years 
earlier. And that really caught the attention of almost everybody. And ever since the whole idea of oral tradition, oral studies, which are the various names that you sometimes hear, has been um, uh, alive in the classical world. Not that there haven't been um, plenty of scholars who have pointed to this problem or this problem. <clears throat> I've been talking a lot and my throat is catching. <coughs> so, excuse me. Okay, so I'll, um, I'm going to go to a question. Lisa Heyer. Uh, Lisa, thank can you, you unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Uh, do you now hear me? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for sponsoring this talk. I uh, benefited from all of that work that was spoken about today. I studied Latin and comparative literature at Berkeley in the 80s, uh, when at that point, the uh, discussion had moved to, um, well, what people's can create epics. And my professor, Carol Clover, caused a great stir because she taught us an African epic called the Mwindu epic. Um, of course, this was the 80s. Um, but, you know, at the time, uh, Berkeley Classics, Cal Classics was, um, you know, really frankly, the best in the nation, perhaps one of the top in the world. Uh, was there something particular about Berkeley that fostered his ability to see Homer in an entirely new way? It would be nice to think that, but I'm not sure um, it's true. He had two several professors at, at Cal, uh, the most notable being Calhoun and Linforth, but there were several, several others. Uh, it's clear he got a good education. And even then, uh, Berkeley Classics was pretty high up in the classical world. But to say that there was something special or unique about the Berkeley Cal um, Greek program or the professors he met there um, that somehow led to this breakthrough, I would be reluctant to reluctant to say. I mean, I would privately doubt it. Um, I would think not. But I don't know. <laughs> we have another question in the chat. Did Marin ever get to college? Um, and the and additionally, whatever happened to uh, Eric's Yugoslavian recordings? Uh, to work backwards, the Yugoslavian recordings are all located at Harvard on the second or third floor of the uh, the library there, in what's called the Mill. Uh, what is it called? Mil Milman Parry Collection of Oral Literature. As to what happened to Marion. Almost the uh, Parry died. She left Cambridge where she felt exquisitely uncomfortable. She felt, uh, she was Jewish and she felt anti-Semitism at Harvard. She just didn't feel comfortable there. And she had cleared out of, she gave books and records to Harvard, but she had decamped with her two children to back to Berkeley. And she lived the rest of her life on Dwight Way near the, uh, uh, the Berkeley campus. And within, I think it was about a year, she had accumulated enough credits in French that she got her a bachelor's, she got all A's in her French class. She's a smart girl. Um, uh, and she, had, she got her BA, but it had to await the death of her husband before she got her degree, mm. which may or may not be meaningful. Let's see if there are other questions. Um, 
what other questions do I have? Did any, does anyone else want to ask a question? Let's see what's going on. Hi, I'd like to ask a question. Hi. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Canigal. Um, I was really interested to read your book. My husband pulled out the review up for me in the New York Times. Um, my name's Christina Chu. I'm a classicist. I teach at Santa Cruz. And um, I'm, a, I'm a Berkeley native. My father went to Tech High. Uh, I mean, I'm an Oakland hmm. native, excuse me. <laughs> I'm a Berk, but three generations uh -huh. of my family went to Cal. But I was the first person to do classics. Um, my Greek teacher was a grad student at Cal. Um, but um, I didn't actually go to Cal myself, but I've been back here. Um, and um, the department, by the way, is changing, has officially changed its name from classics to the Department of Ancient Greek and Roman Studies. And mm. um, yeah, that's a kind of a, 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 something that a lot of classics departments have been thinking now and reassessing what's the meaning of classics. And, um, but, you know, it's great to hear about Homer through the Oakland Public Library. My grandmother, um, her house is actually about two blocks from the main campus used to walk over there all the time. The children's section loved it, loved it. And uh, we used to have a really good friend who was a librarian uh, at Oakland actually. His name was Skip. Hmm. And um, so anyways though, but I was curious, uh, Mr. Canigal, because I've been real interested in Norman Perry as a classicist myself. And, um, um, and also because of his Oakland background, my father is actually a pharmacist and just hearing that Norman Perry's father was a chemist. I was like, wow, Oakland. Um, and um, it all comes but around. I, was, yeah, it's it, tell me about it. Even thinking about Milman Perry as a as a Berkeley son, uh, Berkeley and, and Oakland's son, and then Tech High, of course, you know. Um, but um, one question that I have always been thinking about, and I was wondering if you came across any of this in your research, because you know, classicists we make so much about uh, how he went to Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, to do his research and did all this research in the Balkans and everything. But I wonder if he, if you came across anything about him finding interest, interest in the oral traditions closer to home, because I found it one reference in one of his papers where he mentions Lomax, Alan Lomax, who recorded Lead Belly mm -hmm. and um, all the, the singers in the, you know, around the South and was capturing those traditions in, with similar equipment as Perry is. I was wondering if you came across any of that or if anybody mentioned that because it made me wonder, you know, at the time that Perry lived, there was a big interest in general Simply. in that kind of folk music, oral music, and perhaps maybe that some, something that just sort of jogged himself. I've looked for references, haven't, I mean, I haven't looked that far or hard, but I was just wondering if that was something that you might have, that you might have come across. And, and thank you too, I'm looking forward to reading your book. I think you're right that at that particular moment in the in the 20s and I guess a little later, uh, people, scholars were going into, quote, primitive cultures to record their, um, their folkways. The Lomaxes did. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, one of her jobs during, um, I'm not exactly sure of the timing, but she went into the rural South to record um, people there. Uh, I mentioned earlier my interest in the Great Blasket, the Irish island where people spoke. And um, the same thing was happening there. People went in with whatever the primitive recording equipment of the time was. And turned out to be gone. So there's probably a You'd call it the fashion, the fashions in scholarship, how something can take hold at a particular time and permeate through a field where everybody is kind of doing something similar. So certainly in the 1920s, this something similar was happening, 20s and 30s. I had encountered the reference to the Lomaxes uh, nothing beyond that. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, all, I'm, I'm fascinated. You did so much. Um, like looking through the telephone books and just finding out where he lived in, in Oakland too. I kind of, um, I mean, I figure since he went to tech high, I think he lived on Lake shore sort of around the lake at some points, but I didn't realize his family had moved around so much. No, that's, just, that's really interesting. I, I don't think so. Yeah. I think like, you know, Good Americans, they always wanted to better themselves a little bit, move up a little bit, get something a little bit bigger, but it didn't always, it wasn't always in parallel 
with the prime breadwinner's um, success as a pharma, as a pharmacologist, as a pharmacist. Pharmacist. Well, I have an, uh, another question, and that is, um, I know writers hate to answer this question, but actually, I'm not going to ask that question. I will ask this question. What is it? Is there oh, go anything? Ahead. No, 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 I'll ask it eventually. But um, I want to talk a little bit, since I met you in my writing program 22 years ago, um, I was doing an MFA in Baltimore at Goucher College, and, and Robert came and, and spoke to us to encourage us and tell us what he had learned. And um, so when you're writing, I mean, what uh, appeals to you? What triggers you? What uh, gets you hooked on a particular um, subject? Because in all of your books, you can go pretty deep in uh, digging around in uh, a subject, as you've shown us here tonight, uh, just going into all aspects of a subject, not just their biography and what they did, but all the well, attendant information. One of the uh, reviewers of this book, uh, A.E. Stallings, um, wrote a very good and interesting review in American Scholar and said something like, um, I suppose she meant, meant as a compliment, but I didn't take it at that. She said something like, Robert Canigal is interested in genius and mathematical genius Ramanujan. And one of my books was called Apprentice to Genius, but I, I didn't take it the right way maybe. To me, it pigeonholing. I don't think I'm interested in genius per se. I'm interested in um, and what it's like to be so consumed and uh, um, identifying with an idea, uh, uh, a work, a metier, uh, what, that, what that does to you not always, not always so good. Um, I don't feel at home and as comfortable in group processes where amazing things happen. I tend to be a little bit old fashioned in the sense that I'm interested in the individual and his relationship to his work. And I, when I discover somebody like that, I wanna go all the way and try to understand what his what that relationship was like, so that's the closest I can come to giving you a, a decent answer. Thank you for that. I'm going to check the chat once more. Are there any other questions? Anybody want to unmute themselves and ask a question about writing, about Milman Perry, about classics, and maybe Robert can address anyone. Or we can go home. Or we can go home. It is late there on the back on uh, back east where Robert lives. So, if we have no more questions, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Robert, is there anything you want to say to our guests tonight? I just want to thank you all for coming, and again, I want to thank you, Dorothy, for putting this on and uh, making. And thanks to you and the library, you yeah, individually I'm... and you as part of this collectivity. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for supporting the public library and particularly the Oakland History Center, which is where I uh, make my bread and butter. And um, thanks for supporting me. So we're going to sign off now. Thank you.